Since the release of Toy Story in 1995, Pixar has created so many amazing films with all sorts of compelling protagonists, side characters, and of course, the villains. Beast Jedi. However, since we've already covered which ones are most evil, today, we're gonna tackle the next big question. Who is the most powerful out of all these villains? From toys, to insects, to literal supervillains. Let's see how they stack up. What's up? This is Brad from Wicked Bench, and this is Pixar Villains. Weak to powerful. No, no, I'm a new superhero. Now, since this is a brand new topic we've yet to cover, let's break down the criteria. The first point to make is we'll be ranking these based on their positions of power contextually in their stories, which means that their size and species don't necessarily determine their placement. We want to know how powerful these characters are in their world, specifically in regards to all the characters around them. Otherwise, villains like Hopper would be crushed like the bug that he is. In addition to this, the second point we'll be weighing heavily is how much of a threat the villain is to the heroes of the story. It's also worth mentioning that only the main villain villains will be on this list. Therefore, we won't be adding Dean Hardscrabble or Anton Ego to this list. These two are not necessarily villains. They're simply individuals featured in the respective movies to their jobs effectively. Hardscrabble being a dean to the school, and Ego performing his role as a food critic. This can also include Sterling, since he doesn't really play the role of a villain, just a businessman looking for a way to make more profits toward his company. Now then, we'll be starting with the weakest characters and working our way up to the powerful. In the very last spot, we actually have a tie. However, since both are from the same movie, we think it's understandable to rank the Rustlers and Thunderclaps gang together. Overall, both of these groups aren't very very powerful. The Rustlers are easily beaten down in the fight and run off as soon as this fact becomes clear. Thunderclap's only advantage is his ability to spot a lie, but this does him little good in the end. Truthfully, his gang would have been placed higher on the list because of their ability of flying and outnumbering their enemy to secure food. If only this strength didn't turn into their biggest weakness when food is present, seeing as no one in the group was ever taught the importance of sharing is caring. Maybe they'll learn once their bath time is over. Next up on the weak side of the scale is Sid from Toy Story. In the human world, he's just a disturbed kid with presumably a bit of a messed up home life. But to the toys, he is a killing machine. He tortures toys just for fun! So these two realities kind of balance each other out. He definitely has power over his dog, and he not only messes with his own toys, but he also tortures his sister's toys. He's very capable and knows how to use his tools for his operations. While his ideas may seem morbid to the toys, he does have a creative imagination, judging from how he remakes the toys after dismantling them. From using tape to attach a dinosaur head onto a doll body, combining a fishing rod with a pair of legs, and even using a magnifying glass to melt part of Woody's forehead. Furthermore, since Sid doesn't know that the toys are sentient, he has no problem asserting as much power over the toys as he wants, considering he views them to be just mindless objects. Although a fair point to make, how the heck did Sid get his hands on a rocket that was not meant for kids? Who am I gonna blow? And how in the heck do his parents never notice him playing with explosives? Either he's smarter than he looks, or his parents just don't care what he plays with. Regardless, when Sid finally finds out that the toys are alive, he loses all of his power over them, since he now knows that the toys can think and feel, which, let's be honest, is a terrifying thought to consider. Coming up next is Al from Toy Story 2. A couple of points in regards to how powerful he is. For one, he's not above stealing, lying, and using aggressive means to make a profit. And two, the only reason why Al is seen as powerful to the toys is simply due to the fact that he's a human. And unlike with Sid, the toys cannot interact with Al directly or stop his actions themselves. Of course, judging from his apartment and business, you could say that he's already making a good living for himself, but greed is definitely a major factor in his power arsenal. When you drop the toy perspective, however, Al seems like an unlikable guy who doesn't get a whole lot of respect from anyone and probably doesn't have a whole lot of power in the human world. Moving on to Stinky Pete from Toy Story 2. Pete has a lot of inside knowledge which gives him an edge. 
He also shows signs of mental manipulation as he tries to convince Woody to stay and be part of the collection. He also has great influence over Jesse and Bullseye. His mind games are what give him a lot of his control over the situation at hand. It's too late, Woody. He's even clever enough to frame Jesse for his interferences as he turns on the TV to stop Woody from getting his arm back. He even uses guilt with Jesse and Bullseye to his advantage as well and takes advantage of Woody's insecurities. He finally changes his method when Woody decides to go back to Andy. His methods change from psychological to physical means, using force by any means necessary, including beating up Buzz and tearing Woody to pieces. Your choice, Woody. You can go to Japan together or in pieces. Sadly, that is when his power goes down the drain, as he's quickly outmatched by the other toys. Following Pete is Toy Story 4's villain, Gabby Gabby. She definitely has authority over the Bensons. My name is Gabby Gabby. However, unlike a lot of other villains, Gabby Gabby's kindness is genuine, and she does not actually desire power or control. She doesn't force others to follow her orders, nor does she truly intend anyone harm. She's not demanding or aggressive when she doesn't get her way. She even tells Benson to fix Forky when his arms come off. Despite being the one in power, she's very affectionate, polite, and friendly. It's the voice box that's broken. Does yours still work? She and Forky talk openly to each other. She's very patient, and she does use her talks with Forky to her advantage. However, considering how naive he is, this is not surprising. What makes Gabby Gabby so powerful and helps her to achieve her goals is her sincerity and her good nature. I was defective right out of the box. Since her heart is in a good place and her intentions are pure and noble, she's finally able to convince Woody to willingly give away his voice box so she can get her chance at love and happiness. And she shows deep gratitude for his choice as well. Even so, she's marked as a villain. She gains her power and influence with kindness and respect. This makes quite an impression. The only reason that she's not ranked higher is due to her being non-threatening and the very small number of individuals affected by her actions. Next on our power meter is Charles Muntz, the villain from Up. Muntz, at the beginning of the movie, is considered to be the greatest adventurer ever, even inspiring the main hero of the story in his youth. The man had extensive knowledge, considering the machines he invented for his dogs. However, when he was believed to have brought back a fake skeleton of an unknown creature, he lost all of his credibility and status. Still, Charles Muntz does have control over the dogs and uses the jungle of Paradise Falls to his full advantage. He does possess a great amount of skill to have taken down several ancient creatures from the bones on his ship, and it's safe to say that he killed every other adventurer that entered the falls to find the bird from all the helmets that he has in his collection. Any last words, Fredrickson? So, he definitely can handle himself on a reasonable level. The reason he's ranked so low on this list has more to do with the fact that we never actually see any of his achievements on screen. So, for all we know, the dogs could have played a bigger role in the takedown of these creatures. Get them. Furthermore, the man doesn't have much interaction or influence over anyone out of Paradise Falls, which does take away a lot of his power points. Overall, this guy may not be very powerful, but he's definitely mad with the power he does have. Moving up the scale, we have Roar Omega Roar from Monsters University specifically Johnny Worthington. He's the president of Roar Omega Roar, and as such, his only goal is to make sure that his crew remains the top scares on the campus grounds. They only want the best in their crew, which is why Sully was kicked out of the group to ensure that their reputation didn't slip. Aside from being a hotshot fraternity, these guys don't have much power on campus. However, the students all seem to follow the popular crowd, and since they make fun of the Uzma Kappa, peer pressure means that everyone else goes with the flow. They're strong Stronger and more terrifying, and that fact does give them an edge. However, their arrogance is definitely a big reason why they resort to cheap psychological head games, such as humiliating the competition to make sure that their top spot stays in place. Chick Hicks from Cars is the next up on the list. He's got power and speed on the track, but he does resort to cheap shots just to get ahead of the competition. He's always playing second, which is a big reason why he shoots his mouth off every chance he gets. Hey, what? What's going on? His strongest source of power is his cockiness, and while he put a foot forward for his team, he relies mostly on himself to win, though he's more interested in using powerful positions to break down his competition than he is in improving himself. At least he's nice to his audience and his fans, and he does use his extra time to prepare for his goals. The only real power this guy has is his reputation on the track, his cheap shot tricks, and his drive to outrun the competition, even resorting to stealing his competitor's slogan 
Higgins to fuel in his own ambitions. However, despite the fact that he wins the race, since he won in just an uncool way, many of the audience did not even acknowledge his win, which cost him quite a few power points. Moving on, we have Jackson Storm from Cars 3. The biggest sources of power that this guy has is the fact that he's young and strong, which does manage to get under Lightning McQueen's hood, since he was able to beat the champion quite a few times during their races. You have no idea what a pleasure it is for me to finally beat you. And this does cause him to become very overconfident in himself, which is a big factor in his power threshold, as well as his high-tech equipment, which tracked the numbers in question for racers on the track. But his biggest gain comes from his training and simulations. Once this edge is taken away from him, he resorts to mind games and physical strength to beat his opponents, which as one can imagine doesn't end well for him. Say goodbye to your winning streak, Storm. You'll never be one of us. Coming up next is Chef Skinner from Ratatouille. He's the top chef and the one in charge of the staff, which is why he was angry that Linguini was hired without his knowledge. What? How dare you? However, he didn't give it a second thought when he was told the kid was hired as a garbage boy. Even though he's in charge, his staff has proven to handle most of the situations given without his interference. The second he discovers Linguini cooking, he becomes furious and aggressive, and even threatens him. He gets so upset that he fires the boy for trying to cook. Since he's in charge, he controls a lot of the business, including revenue sales. His whole position of power will be compromised if Linguini turns out to be Gusto's son. That's wonderful. Therefore, he takes measures to ensure his power stays intact. He may have power, but he definitely doesn't have control of his mind. As long as he waits three days to fire Linguini, then his position of power will not be threatened. We now have Randall from Monsters, Inc. Randall is viewed as a top-rated scare for the company, which should be no surprise considering the fact that he can turn invisible. And when I find whoever let it out, they're dead. That would give anyone the creeps. But what places Randall so high on this list is the fact that he's one of the only individuals who knows of the company's new method of obtaining screen power. In addition, this means that Randall has free access to the scare floor after hours. Cheating. Right. During the fights he has with Sully and Mike, his power is shown through his smarts and fighting skills. Too bad for him that Boo was up to bat. Moving on, we've got the dictator of a bug's life, Hopper. At the start of the movie, from the perspective of the ants, Hopper and the other grasshoppers are intimidating and appear to be powerful. Hey, I'm a compassionate insect. However, the grasshoppers only appear powerful because none of the ants are brave enough to stand up to the grasshoppers' oppressive nature. The grasshoppers claim that they're guaranteeing the ants' safety and other bugs may take advantage of the ants. There are insects out there that will take advantage of you. But from their behavior, they're just doing exactly the same actions that the ants fear. But Hopper himself knows that much of the grasshopper's power is an illusion. He does say that the ants outnumber them 100 to 1, and if they ever figure that out, the grasshopper's way of life will end. Those puny little ants outnumber us 100 to 1. That said, Hopper is a dictator, and although he doesn't have the amount of power he wants the ants to think he has, he uses the power he does have effectively to keep them all terrorized. Hopper even uses violence to control the other grasshoppers. And frankly, given the fact that he's made himself the leader of his whole colony and has enslaved an entire colony of ants means that, contextually, he's quite powerful. But the fact of the matter is, his power is fueled entirely by fear and used to control those around him. In short, he's no different than a bully on a playground. As soon as the kids stand up to the bully, his reign is over. Speaking of dictators, let's talk about Lotso Huggin Bear. This Toy Story 3 villain acts like a nice guy to start with, but this is just a front for his actual intentions. You need anything at all, you just come talk to me. Lotso controls the flow of the daycare. He decides who goes into what room and what kind of playtime each toy gets. Lotso thinks that toys who earn their keep get to be in the butterfly room and have access to all the supplies and safety they want. However, if a toy goes against him, then he uses his minions to get them to do what he wants, such as when he reprogrammed Buzz to follow his orders. Ah, that's better. <laughs> Lotso is another authoritarian running Sunnyside Daycare with an iron fist. His front drops when the gang starts to stand up to him. 
he changes from seemingly lovable and reasonable to a cruel, monstrous ruler who uses Buzz for his own gain, and he even threatens those who go against him with a knight in the box, which is a dark, filthy sandbox. As far as villains go in these movies, he definitely is on the high end of the power meter. Lotso also has trucks patrolling the halls and a monkey watching everything on the cameras throughout the whole night. He's even willing to torture toys for the information he needs to keep everyone in line. He's not above using threats to get his way and endangering others. He turns on his own allies and drags his enemies down with him. Overall, this is one bear in the toy world that you don't want to anger, but he certainly has the means to put you in your place. But like many dictators throughout history, he ends up being stripped of his power and strung up publicly. Keeping up with the bear trend, we have Brave's villain, Mordu. His physical strength definitely makes him a tough opponent to handle, especially since he's strong enough to withstand a battle with four men at once and break off a spear's head. Mordu definitely ranks this high for brute strength. Whether other villains use their leadership and charisma as power, Mordu is just a total beast. He even costs Fergus his leg by eating it whole. But what gives Mordu his high placement is the events discovered about his past. Since Mordu was originally a prince who wanted the throne for himself, he caused the destruction of an entire kingdom. Entering our heavy hitters on the power meter, we first have Ernesto de la Cruz from Coco. At the start of the movie, Ernesto was praised as being the best musician in Mexican history. He had tour guides, statues, and even a huge burial chamber in Santa Cecilia. In the words of Miguel, he started out a total nobody from Santa Cecilia, like me, but when he played music, he made people fall in love with him. But when he played music, he made people fall in love with him. He was in movies, had at least four records created, and commanded the attention of an entire audience with just his voice. His motto of seizure moment is so well known and famous that even common musicians know it by heart. His personality makes him charming and deceitful, which has a strong influence on people. The guy has so much influence in the land of the dead that he hosts a giant party, an entire show, and even has a plaza named after him, which calls for a talent show for a musician to play for him at his party. He lives in a tower of luxury and knows a lot of celebrities. I mean, he has a pool in his living room for crying out loud. He has guards who are willing to do whatever he needs them to do and receives many offerings from his fans and the living world. You have to be willing to do whatever it takes. He has countless influence in both the living world and the world of the dead. But after he's revealed to be a murderer, literally everyone turns on him. He loses all of his influence over both his living fans and his dead followers, making Ernesto de la Cruz completely powerless. He did pose a great threat to Hector and Miguel, since he was willing to sacrifice them both just for the sake of his career. On to Waternoose. He's motivational, knowledgeable, and has a high position at the company, being its CEO. He oversees everything that goes on in the company, from the scare floor to the testing simulations. The only ones who have more authority in the company are the CDA and the board of directors. Since Waternoose is the man in charge of the company, and he refused to let anything happen to it, he accepts the idea of using the scream extractor on children to gather the screaming energy needed to save the company. Without scream, we have no power. He even tried to banish Sully and Mike when they discovered his plan. Mr. Waternoose even has enough influence to convince authorities that he was not responsible for the wrongdoings in the situation. His role in the company was so important that the company could have died if the monsters had not discovered a new power source. But at the same time, with any company, CEOs can easily be replaced if the right person steps up to the plate. In fourth place for power, we have Syndrome from The Incredibles. He has his own private island, designs top-secret government experimental technology, and has control over many workers and resources. Resources. My name is not Buddy! He also has incredible knowledge of his surroundings, his weapons, his gadgets, and his enemies, which he uses for his test runs on the weapons he develops. Now you respect me, because I'm a threat. His whole island is filled with technological advancements, and unlike the Supers, or even Batman, he invented his powers and uses them effectively. This gives a very big advantage over his enemies. He's wealthy due to his job creating weapons for the government. He also has enough power to unleash a weapon of mass destruction on the city, has tracked down countless Supers, killed them, and still received enough funds to run his project. Unfortunately, his robot eventually learned how to outsmart even him, which cost him a lot of what he worked for. And since his plan failed, Syndrome has lost all of his power, money, and resources, and his life. Our bronze medal of power goes to the villain of The Incredibles 2, Screenslaver. 
She is the co-owner of a huge company alongside her brother, so she definitely has access to money, influence, and technology. Furthermore, since she stays out of the spotlight, she's able to use her influence without drawing attention to herself, which gives her a big advantage to being screen slaver. She was the one who set up the train failure for Elastigirl to fix. She used Elastigirl's plan and her brother's plan to carry out her own. This is true. What sets her apart from Syndrome is the fact that she's able to frame others easily for her crimes by controlling them through hypnosis and disposes of evidence effectively to avoid getting caught. In fact, her innocent act is how she's able to trick even Elastigirl and take over her. She even took control of the broadcast and put the ambassador in danger just to make a statement to Elastigirl and the other supers. Ironically, this villain's plan failed simply because of a tiny super baby. Silver Metal may seem like an odd choice but we're gonna go with Miles Axelrod from Cars 2. For one, he had enough money and publicity to promote a renewable clean fuel for other cars to use, and taking this even further by arranging a World Grand Prix which features racers from all over the world. That definitely takes a lot of wealth, fame, and connections to get these racers involved in the competition. He's even able to get all the racers to use his new fuel for the race. Furthermore, since he's quite the charmer, he can command the attention of the entire room and throw suspicion off of himself easily. Probably shouldn't be saying this at all, but I hope you win today. Since he's rich, he can hire as many low lives as he needs to put his plans in place, including the professor who we see accomplish quite a great deal in the movie. His powerful influence also nearly causes the deaths of several main characters in the film, including Mater, Lightning McQueen, and our two favorite accents, Holly Shiftwell and Finn McMissile. And for the gold medal of the most powerful of all the Pixar villains, we're gonna go with Otto from WALL-E. Otto takes his job very seriously, basically being second in command on the Axiom. He's the one who handles everything, including teaching the captain how to use basic tools such as books. Manuel? Relay instructions. Furthermore, Otto also knows what a plant is when the captain doesn't. Because robots are in control of everything on the ship, Otto is able to get rid of the plant from Eve without being questioned. Contains no specimen. Furthermore, he's also successful in sneaking the plant off the ship due to the security robots under his command. For the most part, Otto does not mind playing second to the captain. However, due to his programming, he does have power and authority over everything on the ship, but he only seizes control to follow his main direction which is explained to be Protocol A113. We cannot go home. This program states that humans were not to return to Earth, so Otto does what he has to do to make sure his programming is followed, even if this means he has to lock the captain in his room, getting rid of Eve by throwing her down the garbage chute, and nearly killing Wally not once, but twice. From electrocuting him and nearly crushing him to death, even during his battle with the captain, he clearly has the upper hand in the fight. The only thing that stops him is his off switch. Otherwise, it's pretty safe to say who could have won that fight. But what do you think? Who are the weakest? and most powerful Pixar villains. Let us know in the comments section below. Remember to hit that notification bell and binge our Good to Evil playlist where we break down the morality spectrum of your favorite cartoons and movies. But most importantly, stay wicked.